Thank you, Jeremy. I don't know how you feel, but I, I, I feel a little strange. I haven't been talking up here for a long time. I wonder where Roy or Ray or Robert is this morning. Skipped out on church. I kind of liked it. I thought maybe he'd show up again this Sunday, but he hasn't. So here I am. Sorry. Uh, but uh, I, I, think he's, uh, I think he's running a half marathon somewhere here very quickly. We will announce it. And uh, uh, you can be there to encourage him on to the end line. Uh, I thought I, I would... I'm kind of out of practice. I'm not sure how to start my sermon. I was afraid that I'd lose my salary uh, because I've preached so little. So I'm going to try starting with a question from you. How many of you fellas, when you first spied the damsel that was to become your wife, decided to marry her, she's the one, nobody else, in one day? Can I see your hand? All right, one, two, three. Huh, this is at least three. Jeremy was in one day. Okay, all right. How about a week? A week or, or a week or less? Okay, we have, we have another one or two coming in. How about a month before you decided that she was the one? Okay. There's a, oh, oh, we got three. Uh, how, how about half a year before you actually came to that conclusion? Uh, okay. Oh, oh, we've got a few there. How about a year or more? Oh, <laughs> oh what can we say? All right. Big decision. Big decision. Better to think about it for a long time uh, than make the wrong one. There is a counterpart in Christianity to deciding for the girl that you're going to marry. We know that that decision means irrevocable choice. No turning back. Once you make that choice, she's the girl. And forever after, you have to give up all other girls. And you must put your whole life and soul into making that marriage, that family, that union a very, very good one. And so you move from that decision that's inside your heart to a ceremony that is public to let everyone know and to hold you accountable from that time on that that is the choice that you've made. This is my girl till death do me part. Christianity has something very, very similar in it. And that is what we're going to read about and look at today in Romans chapter 6. If you have your Bible with you. Actually, last few verses of chapter 5. It's a topic that I haven't touched on for quite some time. It's a topic of baptism. Baptism in many ways is very similar to that choice of the girl that you would hold on to for the rest of your days. And I'm going to start reading halfway through the second line, the verse 20 of chapter 5. We're just kind of going to parachute in on a theological discussion in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, halfway through verse 20. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And if we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him 
in his resurrection. Baptism is a sign that we have decided to follow Jesus irrevocably. We're going to talk about that today. Look at what the scriptures have to tell us about it. But it's something that the Lord Jesus asks everybody who's made the decision to follow him to step into as a public declaration of that inner, inner decision. Now there are some of you here who may have accepted Christ many years ago. You might have followed him faithfully, but you have never made that step to declare it publicly and officially, I'm Christ's. I've given up all other leaders. He's mine. So that may apply to you, though you may be an older believer. You may be a younger believer. You may have just accepted Christ not too long ago. And this is another step you might need to make in your devotion to Christ. But it is commanded to us. And so today, we want to take a look at this outward ceremonial kind of part of Christianity and see why it is something that the Lord asks us to do. Our text. Our text is in the book of Romans, which is probably the most theological book of the New Testament. Written like a book. It's not a conversation. It's not a letter. It is a theological treatise. And the start of the treatise is the topic of sin. It's our human international problem of huge significance. And that's where Paul starts in chapter 1 and he keeps going right through until almost to where we've gotten here today. Sin is the reason we have marriage breakups. Sin is the reason people call each other names. Sin is the reason why we have corruption in our world. It's the reason we have disease and death. It's why others saw people's heads off and shoot at each other with deadly weapons. All our problems... All our problems stem from this issue of sin. It's huge, massive. It shoots through everything that has to do with human society and individual thoughts and actions. Major problem. I went to a university. We had all kinds of departments in my university. Actually, just to let you know how well-educated I am, in case you didn't, My university is the biggest university in Canada. York University in Toronto. I thought it might add a little to my... But it hasn't. However, do you know that we we did research on all kinds of interesting things at York University? But there was no department studying sin. There were no PhDs at my university that investigated this massive issue that costs us billions of dollars and many, many tears and shattered dreams. Nobody paid attention. But in the scriptures, that is issue number one that needs to be solved. So, for several chapters, the Apostle Paul deals with that problem. And then finally in our chapter, chapter 5, he comes to the solution for it. Verse 6, you see, at just the right time and we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The best news that world history has ever, ever heard. It's why we are gathering here today. Because we're trying to deal with our problem of sin in our lives. And the good news is, it's been done for us due to the gracious, kindly mercy of a loving God at His own expense, sending His Son to die so that our sin could be dealt with. 
Now that's a good old, old story. It doesn't end there, though, because Paul says that we didn't just deal with our personal sin and forgiveness. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Just as sin reigned in death, all those hospitals, all that medical research, all those pharmaceutical companies is combating death. Yesterday I was at the gym and uh, an acquaintance of mine came off of one of the cross trainers, very, very sweaty. And I said, I, you're working too hard. You're going to die. He said, no, that's insurance against heart attacks and death. So even going to the gym is trying to deal with death. We've got a lot of industry, a lot of money trying to fight death. Jesus is the one who sin caused death, it says, so that grace in grace we might reign to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's not just forgiveness. It solves a lot of other problems. It will give us life after death. There's a whole list in that chapter of benefits that Christ has brought us along with forgiveness when we give Him our heart. He's dealt with the issue of sin. So wherever sin brought a nasty result, grace bring, not only reverses it, but brings benefits to it, which has caused some people in Paul's time and in ours to say, wow, that's a great system. So then, should we go on sinning so that grace may increase ever, even more? If God's grace is greater than our sin, then the more we sin, the more grace. So, the more grace, the more benefits. So, let's just keep on sinning, if that's the argument. And here comes our topic. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may live in new life. If we've been united with Him like this in His death, we will certainly be united with Him in His resurrection. Baptism is a symbol of the fact that we are united to Christ in His life. He died because of sin, our sin, and he raised from the dead so that we would be raised from the dead and live forever as well. He's our substitute on the cross. We should have been there. He died in our place. He's our substitute in rising from the dead because he rose. God says we will rise too. We are united with Christ. And that's one of the reasons for baptism. To declare that I am Christ's. So, for example, one of my biggest issues when I first got married was that she got my car. You see, when you're united, what you have, she has. Well, she didn't have a lot, but I had at least a car, right? She got my car. Uh, if, if you buy a home, it's not just your home, it's her home as well. Uh, if you get into debt, uh, it's her debt as well, right? So there are positives and negatives when you come together in one. The benefits and the problems are both of yours because you are united together as one. What happens to one in m most of those cases is part of the life of the other as well. Therefore, Baptism is a sign that we have been united irrevocably in Christ for everything that that means for the rest of our days. That means, I think, that Christ becomes very high priority in our lives. Because whatever stokes Him will benefit us. So if we do what He wants, that accrues to us as a benefit is what he becomes priority number one, like a spouse becomes person number one in another individual's life. Therefore, baptism is a declaration that I finally come to the point in my Christian life where my gaze is off of myself 
and I realize that Christ is my life, and I want everybody to know that from now on, I'm his, I'm going to live the way he is, I'm going to do what he wants, his life is my concern from now on. Hold me accountable. That means that God brooks no rivals. That was, that was brought that was brought home to me uh, some time ago when one of the most influential theologians in the United States uh, not long ago made a declaration. I would say this theologian has more influence than Billy Graham than your favorite preacher times ten. Who's that theologian? Miss Oprah Winfrey. She has a television station that reaches tens of millions of people every week. They read what she tells them to read. They wear what she tells them to wear. She is a highly influential woman. And she was faced with the choice of following Jesus. And she made some comments. Well, obviously she doesn't follow Jesus, right? But she gave her reason. She said, I, I was thinking, I was trying to follow Jesus until I went to church one day and then I had it. That was it. It was over after that. What did she hear? She heard that her pastor said that God was a jealous God. She said, you've got to be kidding. That was it. That was the final straw. I walked out and I haven't gone back. Why did a preacher say that God was a jealous God? Well, if you go to the place where the Ten Commandments are given, that's Exodus chapter 20, that is uh, an early indication of God being a jealous God. Exodus 20, verse 3. God is on the mountain. Children of Israel are down below. This is God's voice. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a what? Jealous God. No competition. I don't want any other gods in your life. If you're going to follow me, I am the only one, the one and only one. I am your highest priority. I, ha I want no competition in your life. God will not brook another God or another influence of His rank in your life. So therefore, He is a jealous God. Now, is Oprah Winfrey justified in saying that's ridiculous? That's such a primitive idea of God that we moderns should never fall for that. Well, you get married and you tell somebody, well, I think I want to go out with my old girlfriend just to see maybe I made the wrong choice to see what happens. Your car may be, well, I don't know, uh, a famous golfer tried that. And a baseball, oh, a golf club broke his car window and he ended up against the fire hydrant. And he, I think he lost his yacht and his home and his kids. Uh, that's the way it is when you get married. No competition, no rivals. We are justified in being jealous if another takes number one spot because that's the only way marriage works. And the Bible says that's the only way life with Christ will work. So when we stand up and say we are going to be baptized, we're saying we acknowledge there's no room for other gods in my life. Nothing at that level of priority except God himself. Now that may get you in trouble. Because there's other people and other influences which may compete for your loyalty. Actually, you might act very differently from a lot of people at work or at school or in your friendship circle. You may do things that puzzles them because it doesn't make any sense unless, of course, Christ is number one in your life. And when you take that step of baptism, you are saying, nevertheless, I will hold to that line. Keep me accountable. I'm telling you all today, that's what I plan to do. 
And from that day on, you must walk faithful to the Lord Jesus. All right, we need to go further in this thing of Paul talking about being united to Christ and baptism reminding us of it. The thing that he uses to remind us of it is this topic of not sinning. We died to Christ. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may live new life. That is in regards to this question about sinning. Can I keep on living the way I used to before I made this choice to follow Christ? Because a lot of people feel that you can, you can put the two together. Why get radical? How about a little bit of God in your life? How about a little of your regular life in your life? Don't get all worked up about this one way Jesus kind of thing. Take it easy. Things might work out. And that goes with sinning. That goes with the way I used to live before Christ became a priority in my life. And it says that baptism itself is a symbol of what we are going to do with that topic in our life. It says that when you go down under the water and it covers you, you are symbolizing dying and burial, your own. With regards to your former way of life, it's dead, it's over, it's gone. There's no return to that old style of life. Then when we rise again, as Christ rose up from the grave, it's a new life unto God. And the old is dead, forgotten, never to come back. Actually, this death thing is... is is pushed a bit in the scriptures for a greater meaning. Let, let me read to you another scripture that tackles that same topic, uses similar words. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. It lists things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed. Uh, must rid yourselves of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Uh, all those things, we are to put them to death. Now, putting to death is, in colloquial English, murder. Uh, it's, it's premeditated mortification. The old King James said, mortify whatever belongs to your earthly nature. That means... Plain English, just murder it. We had the privilege in one of our pastorates to be next door, living next door to a murderer. His name was Jerry. Believe it or not, Jerry was a pretty nice guy. You could leave 500 bucks on your kitchen table, give him the key to your house and say, we're going for a two-week holiday. When you came back, the $500 would still be on your table. No question. Except when Jerry got drunk. And then Jerry turned into a different person. So one day when we were both out in our backyards and talking over the fence, Jerry told me what had happened. Well, he said, uh, I had an argument with my business partner and I got very mad with him and I said I was going to kill him. So he said, I got into my truck and I drove 10 miles back to my house and I got my gun and I loaded my gun I put it into my half ton and I drove 10 miles back. And when he came out of his door, I leveled the gun over the hood of my truck. And Dave, I blew him away. Died on the spot. A man with a wife and family. Gone. He said, I got a life. I got a life for it uh, because it was murder. I said, Jerry, what's murder? He said, it's premeditated. In other words, he said, when I went up to the judge and tried to plead my case, it didn't work because I told my buddy I was going to kill him. So I, I, I already said it. And then I deliberately got in my truck and drove 10 miles to my house. That took some thinking. 
And then he said, I got my gun and I loaded it and I drove 10 miles back and then I killed him. And he said, that's murder. It's premeditated. It's thought out. It means that I didn't just do it in self-defense. I did it on purpose. That's the word that we're talking about here with sin. It says murder, premeditatedly put to death your old sinful habits. So when you go down in the water, you say, I am going to murder my former way of life. In other words, I'm going to promise myself that's what I am going to do. And then I'm going to plan out a way to make sure I do it. Then I'm going to practice it until finally it becomes a new habit formed in place of the old one. I'm going to continue to mortify, put to death, kill my old way of life. I pledge to do this as I walk through the waters of baptism. It's a no turning back kind of promise. I'm not just accepting Jesus to forgive my sin. I now will be united with him in his desire to live righteously. And I will take all the effort necessary to put my old way of life to death. For some of you, I know it's an old topic. When the apostles first began to baptize Christians, here is the sermon that the apostle Peter preached on that occasion. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice the order. Repent and then be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus That means that we here practice believer's baptism. You must first be of sound heart and mind to the degree that you can make the decision to repent. Actually, you've got to be old enough to understand that you're a sinner and that Jesus is the relief or the remedy for that sin so that if you were baptized when you were about 20 inches long because your parents lovingly had good intentions for you, you probably didn't repent. And they can tell you the stories of how that was shown as you were growing up. So probably that baptism didn't have a lot of effect because you didn't do it the way it's prescribed. You didn't first repent and then be baptized. So you must first repent and believe in Jesus and then as a sign of that, take a step of declaring it publicly in baptism. That's called being a believer first or believer's baptism. I'm not sure how many of you here have made the decision to follow Jesus and have not yet followed him in baptism. And so I'm going to put it to you that this is something that the Lord calls us to if we are serious about living our life for the Lord to make that public declaration of our intentions, realizing that we are united with Christ, there will be no other gods competing with it. He's a jealous God. There's only one that can take that place in our life and we're putting him there and we're going to keep him there. And we are going to mortify sin. We're going to meditate on how to deal with that and make sure we go through with it. We are going to steadfastly become more and more like our Christ. And we are going to prove that by consciously declaring it in baptism. I've always been interested in history around the time uh, that the events of Scripture took place. I'm not much of a history student, but I was interested to read about Julius Caesar the first dictator in the Roman Republic and how he gained the strength to become a dictator. One of the great wars that he fought that has affected us has been that he conquered England. Uh, That was a tough job 
you had to not only conquer France first, but then you had to get in boats and all your equipment and bring them over to this island and then attack the natives there. Knowing it was tough, they got in our matter of boats. Caesar put his army in it and all the supplies that were necessary and crossed. What, what's that piece of water in between there? English Channel. Now you wonder who named that. Why didn't the French get call that the French Channel? Or if it was international politics, the English French Channel probably today, right? Probably draw, draw a line down the center. But anyway, for us it's the English Channel. And then he got his troops out of the boats and up the cliffs, up on top of the plain. And there he assembled his army. And one of his first commands was to turn around and look back over that body of water that they just sailed over. And what did they see? On the beach where they had just landed with all their armada of boats were boats that were all aflame. While they were walking up the cliffs on Caesar's orders, every boat was set aflame. And as those men looked down where they had come from, they realized that every avenue of escape for them was now gone. They would either fight their enemy and win, or they would die on this island because there was no way to get back. It was an irrevocable decision to move forward. I suspect that that is somewhat what baptism is all about in the Scripture. You receive Christ. You find out what that's like. And then you realize that this is a big choice. This is going to mean changes in your life that will cost you. And you have to come to a place where you're willing to burn the boats behind you and say, I'm headed in this direction. I am never going back. I want you all to know it. That's what baptism is all about. We're going to pray here in a moment and we're going to go home. But the choice is on each heart. And so if over the next week, God speaks to your heart and you feel that you are ready to take the step of baptism, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, we plan to organize a baptismal service, probably be done in a river here uh, soon before we get into the summer holidays. But while it's still nice and toasty warm, and uh, so may God lay it on your hearts, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you received Christ a long time ago or just recently, this is for each one of us to consider before God himself. Let's bow.